<laughs> What's up, hey, Flynn? June Welcome 11, 2020. I hope you're recovering from that uh, big poker tournament we had last night. Raised a lot of money. How you feeling today, Anthony? Uh, man, I played really well. I'm really proud of myself. Uh, yeah, keep believing it. All right, Anthony, uh, what a fun time last night, raising poker for charity. Can you believe it, Anthony? Your efforts, we helped raise over $4,200 last night alone for the Hospitality Strong Initiative. Yeah, that, yeah, and all the money goes directly to the hospitality community, to those people that are struggling. So, And it was fun, and I will never uh, help um, host a show, drink Johnny Walker Black, and play poker. Um, those were, I, I think I bought in four times and finally had a hijack and she and I won. <laughs> well, the good news is you're helping the hospitality professionals out there find their way forward. And, uh, when you say you're not going to do exactly that way again, I suspect you're going to place Johnny Walker black with Johnny Walker blue. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And, and maybe I'll try to get some sleep before I do the show next time. So, uh, but I don't, I don't think I'm fully recovered from last night, but it was fun. And like I said, hundred percent of the proceeds goes to hospitality success, uh, hospitality strong, uh, so please go to GoFundMe, Hospitality Strong, USA Hospitality Strong, if you'd like to donate. And we're going to have another poker tournament. And this time, I, I'm i not going to host it or help host it. And I am not going to have um, anybody watching me play. Uh, that mm -hmm. was a mistake. I, I I couldn't concentrate for one minute. I, te I played terrible. I lost four times. But, um, you know. It, it, I like it is what it is. I like how you're going about setting up the excuses now before Chris Green joins us later, who was the big winner of the uh, of the tournament. But Anthony, before we get all, into all of this, uh, you got something coming up today at two o'clock, don't you? Yeah, at two o'clock we're doing uh, something called X the Experts uh, at hospitalitysuccess.com. You can go for all the uh, information, or you can go to Facebook at uh, Hospitality Success. Uh, on our Facebook page and get all the information. We have a free webinar called Ask the Experts. You have a question, me and my partner answer the question. It could be revenue management, investment, development, operations. So please, two o'clock today, it's free and it's fun. And uh, you will have a half hungover uh, poker player. Excellent. No, I, I I love that. Well, today uh, I'm half hungover. You're half hungover. So, you know, we've got a lot of hanging over to do, but I am also uh, excited to announce um, been a lot of talk about virtual events out there and we couldn't help but get involved in that kind of world. So uh, producer Jeff, myself and uh, Craig Sullivan of the Click Conference are going to be launching the Hotel Reboot Podference Series. It's going to be four issues, one start, starting on Wednesday, June 24th. Covering all sorts of different topics such as redesign, redevelop, reinvent, refinance, and refuel. It's all about ways to bring your back business back to profitability mindset with real solutions to the real problems that you're having out there. Stay tuned for more of that. It's going to be great. Check out hotelreboot.com for more information. We should be launching that site really soon. I'm excited to try something new. And this is a time of reinvention, Anthony, don't you think? Well, congr congratulations. I just wish I would be invited, but I'm an operations guy. <laughs> this is going to be the world's longest ongoing Listen, giving me a let, hard let me, time. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. I've helped develop, build, and I was an asset manager for three years yes. of $2 billion worth of assets. For you to call me just an operations guy is an insult. I'm sorry. I apologize because that was not exact, That was not the intention of my comments, and I chose words poorly. So I'm sorry, Anthony. I hope you will find yeah. in your heart to forgive you're, you're, me. Okay. Now you can invite me uh, to one of your classes. Okay, All right. Thank awesome. You. I, would love to, I would love to do that. We'll talk about that uh, offline. But we've got great people, including uh, brand leaders, good CEO people, the money people that are out there. So it's really going to be what you need. Highly interactive, real-time polling, live audience interactions, a real, real show, not just, a boring, not just boring people pontificating about things, real practical information. But speaking of changes, we've got a uh, We've got Ryan Ribbit here, the uh, CEO of My Place, who just announced a brand new brand. What do you think we talked to him about? Do you think that's a good idea there? Uh, uh, why don't we do that? That's a good idea. Greg. Let's, do, so let's do it. Boop! There he is, Ryan Ribbit, CEO yeah. of My Place Hotels. Welcome to the show, man, and congratulations. I don't know if you're incredibly smart or incredibly insane launching a brand new brand, Trend Hotels and Suites, which is going to be a collection of upper mid-scale and upper select service and extended stay uh, properties. It's the second brand to come from the company. All new construction extended stay chain that has uh, 56 locations already. Of course, it's the My Place brand. Now, the Trend brand, you're looking at conversions here, which I think you believe is going to be a hot market in the next couple of years, right, Ryan? Yeah, it is. I think we're going to we're gonna have a good time with this. It's uh, 
it's yet to be seen whether we're incredibly smart or incredibly stupid. We won't know until <laughs> the future. Well, but. no matter what, you're incredibly gutsy. I love that you guys have been pushing forward. And that's one of the things that I've uh, really enjoyed about your company. You're kind of the, uh, the consummate insider, but the consummate outsider at the same right. time. And you seem to be playing that same formula once again. Well, the timing of it and the and the, the the purpose of it is really balanced. I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to capitalize on our mm -hmm. strength and infrastructure as well as uh, timing circumstances and to provide some value for a lot of operators out there. Yeah, and right now is a perfect time because I'm already hearing from people in my in, um, I consult and, and and I hear it every day. Is should we uh, should we open an extended stay hotel? And if you look at all of the um, metrics in the last three months i think the answer is those do, in the last 10 years people have been really looking at that market and now the last three months you really see that that is something that people that's their go-to uh segment so congratulations right. thanks and the, the my place product was really developed intentionally for recession resilience um and unfortunately we've had the opportunity to prove a lot of that up over the last few months and so uh we're happy about that we've been enjoying that now trend is kind of the next the next adventure for us and um it's so, so explain that brand explain it so focused on what i'll call middle-aged upper mid-scale and upscale uh limited service and extended stay properties there's a lot of properties in that 2005 and newer range that um, need a new home that need uh, a better level of support we believe and so we've got an opportunity to diversify our portfolio of properties in the chain of my place hotels with uh, a conversion option. My place is all new construction, all extended stay. We're gonna blend in some, some differentiation, some operators that uh, otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to join into our system and, and get the level of support. And what, what, what markets are you looking at? You know, generally speaking, uh, everywhere in the country, there isn't anything that's prohibiting us uh, with the exception of where we've got existing My Place hotels. Uh, but I think a lot of our opportunity is going to come from suburban markets and secondary uh, and, and primary cities around the country. Uh, it sounds like a lot like the formula that you followed to find success uh, thus far. What are some of the things that are going to be characteristic of the brand uh, Trend Hotels and Suites? And how are you going to be out there uh, approaching the, uh, the community of hoteliers? I think we're we're going to focus on the autonomy of the hotelier. We're going to focus on the individual strengths and the individual market share uh, and market knowledge that the that the operators got. And um, contrary to the My Place brand, where everything's very rigid, very prototypical, and standardized, as we've set it up, we're looking for flexibility. We're looking to make sure that we hear uh, the operators and what they're good at, what their hotel is good at, and what their individual guests and their markets want, and then work to support them, to, to bring in underlying support to that and, and solidify the foundation. What's the biggest challenge outside of the obvious with COVID that you have now that things have changed? Because it's not only COVID has changed everything. I think there's going to be some long-term changes that are just going to be um, in, in, in the veins of our industry. Um, so what's the biggest change that you see? I think the the hotel industry is inherently adaptive. I mean, we're we're constantly adapting on a daily basis because we have so many different demographics of guests and circumstances that walk through the doors every day. And probably the most difficult thing that uh, part of this storm that we're weathering is the uncertainty. Uh, we've never had as much uncertainty in the, in our world and certainly in our industry today, both on on both sides of the desk. So I think that's that's going to be, uh, the biggest thing we need to roll with and, and continue to increase our ability to adapt to is, is just uncertain times, uncertain status quo, uncertain standards and, and regulations and, and things are going to be the biggest challenge for us. Yeah. So, all right. So one of the, uh, the key elements, uh, that you guys are going to be doing is a 5% franchise, uh, royalty based on a uh, gross room revenue. And, uh, those that are acquired before September 1st will incorporate a provision for royalties to be zero for 30 days after the conversion date, uh, before moving to that 5%. That's a, uh, that's pretty impressive. You're trying to keep it a little bit straightforward for owners and operators. What kind of, uh, discussions have you been having out there with potential folks that might go ahead and convert to your new brand? Initially, the discussions have have been really based around whether or not um, whether or not their hotel qualifies. Uh, most most of the discussions are really what is this and and how do I fit into the model of what you guys have? I think everybody's been really appreciative of of our initiative to work with 
with hoteliers and work with them. We've got the infrastructure put together with the momentum of my place growing uh, and the infrastructure surrounding our organization. We're able to take on a lot more hotel locations uh, without having to make significant expansions in staff and support systems. And so we can afford to, to work with them in terms of the, the franchise royalties and, and uh, uh, the, the cost of brand affiliation on the front end. So, so how so, do you compete? How do you compete with all the big brands? It seems like every other day they're, they're in, in, you know, they're implementing a new brand. And I would imagine they're going to start implementing some extended stay brands in the next year or so. Like, how do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot going to be coming at you. I think, I think what we, how we deal with that is one conversation at a time. We deal with that by developing relationships with the individual people that we talk to. We're not going out trying to cast a wide net, be everything for everyone, uh, or, or focusing only on one specific demographic or one specific uh, geographic area of the country, but really based on the natural fit that occurs when somebody gets an interest in the product or the, or the concept that we have, and then we can reinforce that by building a relationship within the first few minutes of the phone conversation. Uh, that's, that's how we compete. And, and we're, we're comfortable with that. That's the way we've been doing it uh, for a long time. here. Yeah. So it's, uh, you, you probably have a whole group of people that you could now go back to that you've started mm -hmm. discussions with, but weren't in that category of I'm going to go ahead and create a new build property. Right. 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 And, and so we've had probably, uh, probably as many phone calls about conversions to my place hotels, if not more phone calls about conversions to my place hotels, um, than we have about new builds in the, and, and expanding the my place chain. There's a lot of people out there who've been calling us for years now wanting to know if they can convert their property to a my place. And so, uh, having understood that that was the case over the last few years, we've just really been looking for the right opportunity to go into and, and access that opportunity or that that group of people that are interested out there. And and so the pandemic situation um, mixed with our momentum and growth in my place and uh, where we're at really was the catalyst for doing that. I mean, we trademarked the name for Trend in 2017. This isn't a new concept internally. Uh, we have just been really waiting for the right timing to uh, throw it out there and, and see what happens. That's interesting. So you just kind of had it up on the shelf and you're like, oh, the world is falling apart. Let's pull it out. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's the concept. When you have a product, you're always looking for what's the next thing. And right. what, what we naturally are looking for is something that's diversified from the primary core that we have. Right. And this is it. Right. And it is really hard to separate yourselves with all the brands that are out there. And uh, this sounds like a, a, a great opportunity to do that. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of going through what that hotel looks like, if I'm a guest um, or a leisure guest, business guest, what, from, from the many standpoint, breakfast, you know, just tell me everything that, that you would get in this kind of brand. Right. And Ryan, I'd like you to also add, sir, um, there might not be, might be people here who are not familiar with my place. So maybe if you could draw some parallels and differences between the two. Sure. sure. Well, so my place hotels is typically a, a, a 64 to 85 room, all extended stay hotel. Um, it's all, all new build. And uh, generally we're, our locations, 56 of them today are located within secondary and tertiary markets throughout the country, not by design, but, but just by the way we've grown to this point. Um, you'll find everything consistent with a My Place Hotel. It's, it's exterior finishes change slightly to, mit, to fit the surroundings that they're in, but otherwise the envelope and the building and the rooms and the service that you get is all very well trained and incorporated into the model. Uh, now with a trend hotel, what you're gonna find is the same Holiday Inn Express or Hampton Inn or any other branded hotel that you may have stayed at in a location where the operator finds that the best opportunity for them is to convert to a trend hotel, you're gonna to continue to find the same offerings, the same amenities, the same uh, guest service and, and, and same quality that you found prior to that hotel changing the signs on the building. And that's why I say we're, we're focused on autonomy and we're focused on the individual strengths of the, of the hotelier. There may be aspects of that hotel that um, the, the hotelier, whether franchisee or operators identified, hey, this is dead weight or this doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. The majority of our guests don't utilize this amenity. Um, and so we're, we're really, really focused on making sure that we work with the operator to find out what they do best and and what they provide their hotel their hotel guest with the best. And so there may be subtle changes that happen with a with a trend hotel as it 
as it converts to and, and onboards onto the trend program. But for the most part, we expect to keep everybody's hotel uh, operating the status quo and, and continuing to provide. You know, and that's interesting. Quality. That's interesting because the number one uh, concern that I get from owners all the time is that there's no flexibility. It's like, yes, I like the brand. Yes, I want to be part of that brand, but I have no flexibility. I don't feel like it's my hotel. I feel like if it's like I, I got the investment, but now it's the brand's hotel and I have zero flexibility. And it's frustrating because those areas that they're asking me to focus on really aren't bringing anything to the bottom line. So, And we know the really big brands that have been there for doing that long because they're so big and the ship is so uh, wide that you have to do it this way or you, you have to go to get another brand. So it's really good to hear that you have that flexibility. We do. And, and that's that's why the timing of this is really good, because for us, we've developed we've developed supply chain, we've developed infrastructure and support that uh, any one of our My Place franchisees would tell you how happy they are with uh, the relationship that we have there. And now we have the ability to take that to franchisees of other brands and in a, on a conversion basis, come right. in and say, hey, we understand your desire for flexibility because we're hotel operators at the core. Um, we have to manage that, and that's a challenge. And like you said, the, the ship's too big and some of the other brands. We're small enough now to be able to do so, but I think we also have the right perspective and the right motivations for doing what we're doing uh, that mix in with that, that desire for flexibility of the franchisees that creates a recipe for success for, for a long time. And how's the challenging um, financing environment right now um, for your for your brands? Just total the new brand, and the old brand. You know, I think the challenges for financing on the new brand on, on trend hotels are are going to be very unique, one to the next. There's a lot of guys out there that are dealing with uh, challenges on CMBS debt. Again, with trend, we're talking about long term. We're talking about stabilized assets here, not new build hotels. Um, and, and there may be some, some over leverage positions. There may be some things that we have to come alongside of a franchisee and work with them in determining the best way to address the, their lenders concerns and the carry forward on, on credit facilities, uh, on the, my place brand being all new build, you know, the typical, my place property is, is, uh, is around 70, 65 to $70,000 a room. Uh, all in without land. So we're, we're, we're not talking about a large slice relative to a lot of our competitors out there. And so it's been more well received. We've got a handful of active franchise sales right now. We've got a few franchises that are just moving forward with their development. Um, all of our franchisees have been successful in maintaining relationships with their lenders throughout this period and getting the, the appropriate concessions and things that, that have helped them to uh, maintain profitability through the through the pandemic and, and government shutdowns and things like that. So um, the My Place product has been really well received. It's right size for a situation like we've been in right now. Uh, the trend is uh, trend product is going to be, again, unique one to the next. And so right. uh, we've got a lot of relationships. We've, we've had a lot of portfolio properties internally for, for a long time here. And so have a good understanding generally on, on uh, what the circumstances can be through these situations, but we're here, we're willing to, uh, to join the. So how, challenge, how challenging is it when you're bringing a new brand to a hotel that maybe an owner is switching brands. And one of the reasons they left is because the pip that they were asked to do was su such a big pip that they weren't willing to do. And now they're coming into your brand where you're going to ask them to do a pip and maybe, you know, they're, they're challenged to do that, um, especially in this economy. Has that come up a lot? And, and how do you deal with that challenge? It has come up. Um, and as, as a franchisee of other brands prior to starting my place, um, we understand the PIP scenario. We understand the conversation that comes about that is, hey, look, I've, I've spent an average of 8% of my gross revenue on capital improvements on my hotel over the last three years. And now because there's a because there's a mandated standards change, you're asking me to spend a million and a half dollars in a in an eight million dollar all in hotel. I just can't justify that. It backs off too much ROI uh, on the time period that I've owned it. And so we we understand that the inflexibility there is something that has been an inhibitor to uh, sales and recapitalization of assets for hoteliers. It's been it's been a reducer. Uh, to return on investment over the life of, of their investment in the holding of their hotel. And so we're, we're 
hoping to be able to uh, work with franchisees to determine the best course of action to create a relevant improvement plan. And as opposed to just a property improvement plan where, you know, one size fits all and here's all the things that you have to do, we're looking at it on the basis of what are the relevant improvements that need to be made in your hotel? What's the timeline that's relevant for those improvements to be made? Uh, and, and, and what's the satisfaction of your guests now? How much can we improve that? Uh, and, and where's your profitability? Where's your where's your uh, gross offer operating profit coming in right now versus where we think it can be uh, if we can make a few changes and uh, and attract some additional uh, customers or justify an increase in uh, room rates. So, All right. So when when it comes to uh, trend, I know you're going to be looking for uh, some of that that the the red meat, which is the uh, that select service product, right? But you. Right are focused on extended stay. Just to give uh, owners and operators of current hotels that might be thinking about moving to the extended stay in this kind of fashion, what are some of the bigger things that they might have to consider when they're thinking about moving over to your brand? Well, I think um, what they should consider is that the, the extended stay component that we've been focused on with my place is in many cases going to be an added uh, business segment to their hotel. The, the relationships on a national sales basis and revenue management basis that we've created uh, between consortias, between individual boots on the ground marketing and sales that we've done in my place are something that aren't necessarily as prevalent in the typical living and service property. So what we can what we can bring to the table in their hotels by by managing those relationships into the new trend hotels uh, and likewise by by managing uh, relationships that these those trend hotels have in existence before they come on um, are going to be able to be balanced between the two the two products we have a bigger demographic uh, profile to work with now and we can use the same techniques and the same relationship management uh, uh, strategies that we've used to bolster my place hotels both before and during the pandemic period uh, into limited service segments. So it's really, <clears throat> it's really an opportunity to better diversify what we have, better diversify what the uh, existing hoteliers in the limited service segment have. Right. Uh, really, uh, really uh, interesting. So where does all of this go uh, for you guys in the future? What is, what is the, the general hospitality community thinking maybe about extended stay products in, in, in general? And where, where do you think we're going headed to in the future? You know, I think extended stay is really going to continue to grow. Um, we've we've the whole segment of extended stay has really shined over the last few months and, and throughout this what we'll call a recessionary period, uh, and I think we'll continue to do so um, as we continue to to capitalize on on that success and grow that success. Uh, there's also probably a for redistribution of hotel supply around the country to refocus it into other areas. If, if uh, business travel changes a bit because people have recognized there's some efficiencies in teleconferencing as opposed to in-person meetings, uh, is that sustainable? I'm not sure, but, but we're going to address it uh, one to the next. At the end of the day, the extended stay crowd that's, that's out there, the demographic of people that are traveling that stay for a week or longer or are continuously in the market for a week at a time, uh, I think that's going to continue to be the case for as long as we have mechanical systems that need to be repaired and and assets that need to be built. And so extended stay remains strong and there's an opportunity for us to uh, boost limited service properties as well based on what we know and what we're doing in extended stay. Excellent. Um, Anthony, any final questions for our, for our no, friend? Ryan? I, think, I think you answered them all. I think, uh, you know, you, 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 hit, you hit the meat of the bat, I think, on this one. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. We're gonna we're gonna have fun with it, and uh, look forward to talking to you uh, guys about it more in the future. Hey, Ryan. You know what? Uh, I think it's only fair to give you a good uh, shameless plug here. How can people find you if they're interested in uh, in connecting with you about learning more about Trend Hotel and Suites? Find us uh, find us at myplacehotels.com. Uh, also, find us at uh, trendhotelsandsuites.com. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here, Ryan. We'll see you hopefully again uh, real soon. Lots of luck to you thank on you, the friend. new brand. All right. Um, I know, Tom, you're, you're backstage. We're going to bring you in in just a minute, but we have to do something really important first. So uh, let's Don't get to it. it. We're oh, we're doing it. Oh, yeah. we're doing it.
Uh, what should I do? What should I do? I say he just quit, Anthony. I have King Thursday. And the big deal here is if Chris happens to lose to Anthony every Tuesday and Thursday, you guys will be uh, hearing about it. No matter what happens, we're going to be hearing about it, Dave. That's, yeah, that's exactly what I think. Fun. But Anthony's all in. Oh, okay. oh, so Chris has a pair of queens. Anthony's about to be out. Oh, my God. God. Here. Anthony oh! is out. Busted. Anthony is out. Busted. Chris Green has officially knocked out Anthony Melfury. And we aren't even playing excitement? for an hour. Here comes Chris Green. <laughs> Chris Green. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. Of all Thank people you. to beat me. <laughs> I know, I know exactly what the topic's going to be on tomorrow's show, baby. <laughs> I know exactly who's not going to be on tomorrow's show. <laughs> All right, good move, Anthony. <laughs> What's it feel like to win a hand? It's been such a long time. Let's see if Chris can knock out Anthony twice. That would be something. So it's Chris and Anthony. Oh, Chris with a pair oh, of kings. Oh! And queen. Oh, 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 Chris knocks Anthony out again. Anthony calls. Anthony calls. He's all in, which he is. Oh, so, so, so let's see. We have Anthony going to get knocked out again. Jack Queen. Oh, pair of sixes. So, oh, ooh, Anthony oh, is in trouble. It. He's oh, in he trouble. Jack Queen on the oh, 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 Anthony is out again. Out again. He is out Three again. Times. Oh my God. All right. Welcome to the show. The one, the only Chris Green cha <laughs> champion of the first ever Hospitality Strong uh, tournament. Uh, Chris, congratulations on such a big win and shaming our friend Anthony, not once, but twice. I'm, I'm just very thankful I was able to participate in the charity event. I'm having trouble seeing you guys. There's something in my way. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I think it might be the hardware I picked up last night on the crushing that I put in place. I, Chris, yeah. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to play with someone at, at your level of poker. And uh, I'm honored again to see you this morning. And I truly appreciate uh, the time uh, you took in teaching me how to play poker. So thank you, sir. Well deserved. <laughs> I had a great time. And it was super fun to talk about, uh, you know, just, just hear from industry leaders and some other people in our business. And then I think we raised a good amount of money for the Hospitality Strong. Yeah, USA over right? over four thousand two hundred dollars just last night alone. How great it is! But guess, guess what, everybody? It's not too late to continue to donate. No, you could go right ahead. If we could bring up that uh, that address, we'll get it scrolling across the screen. Feel free, give whatever you want: ten dollars, five dollars, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, whatever you can would be. And, mo and, mo and most importantly, I just taught um, all the young people out there a public relations uh, play. <laughs> that um, my friend Chris was coming on here and he thought I was going to be guns blazing. And I simply took all the energy back. He did. He took it away from me. <laughs> but I, I, can do, I can do this again, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right um, so great great job and, and, and at the end of the thing i may have dropped an f-bomb so i apologize and um i may have been um a little bit um johnny walker was hanging out with me last night so i think i, <laughs> I, I got started too early with the johnny walker but uh good game and like you said there were like 10 of us and what great people and nice people and and again a shout out to the producers and to glenn um just almost a flawless um, uh, performance as far as production. And um, no, but was, not, not your performance, though. No, no. My performance was less than flawless. Um, but it was fun, you know, and that's what it's about. You know, there was no prizes awarded. It was all money for charity. But it was fun. It was loose. And listen, I think that's the most fun I've had in three months. So thank you. Yeah, it was a good time. It reminded me a little bit of just being normal in hospitality and hanging out with guys and having a good night and just joking and having fun. It was really a great night. I, I recommend that if you have the ability to get a group together and do that, whether it's a social hour or a happy hour or something, we had a great time. Yeah, yeah, we're we're going to be doing it again very soon. Yeah, so, for sure. I'd like um, to encourage some of the women out there to get involved in playing poker because you were not represented at all. And I know there's some great female <laughs> poker players out there. All right, let's bring in uh, our next guest for this uh, this panel discussion from uh, from Lord, the president of Coral Tree Hospitality. How good is it to, for you to see that Anthony lost poker, Tom? Well, first of all, I just want to hang out with you guys because Anthony said Johnny Walker and an F bomb in one sentence. <laughs> Then you talked about hospitality and getting back to normal. So, uh, Chris, <laughs> if you ever need a wingman, I'm your guy. 
Well, well we, you can absolutely play on the next tournament. And uh, if you don't want to, you can still donate to USA Hospitality Strong. And uh, it was a fun time last night. And um, I will tell you the first time when I lost the first round, um, I was really trying to win. I mean, I really did not want to. And I was, I was trip leader pretty quick. I was triple everybody else's pretty quick. And then when so Chris took me out, I just became unraveled and was not <laughs> able to handle that. It's a pretty nice trophy, Chris. Was you know parading? Uh, yeah, there. we spent a lot of money yeah. on that trophy. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. So, uh, now, Tom, maybe for those that aren't familiar with your company, give us a quick thirty-second rundown on who you are and what your company is all about. Yeah, thanks, Ken. First of all, great to see you guys. Uh, so, Coral Tree Hospitality, uh, small management company located in Denver, uh, we're actually a legacy company. We we're at one time called Destination Hotel Resorts. Uh, we were the largest operator of independent hotels and resorts in the country. And then we bought uh, Commune Hotels and Resorts back in 2016, uh, the, the family office of uh, John Pritzker. And that brought in the brands of Thompson and Joadaviv and Alila. And then, uh, in, in December of 2018, we ended up selling most of our management contracts and the brands to Hyatt Hotels. So as a result of that, we then restarted again. Uh, the day we sold to Hyatt, we also created Coral Tree. We brought in uh, my entire executive team that was wow. with me with Destination Hotels. And now Coral Tree's got uh, really unique hotels and resorts around the country. Uh, we're in the U.S., we're in Mexico, small. Our whole intention is to be, uh, you know, my phrase, frankly, Glenn, is to be anti-corporate. Uh, we mm -hmm. eliminate all these layers, the fancy titles of, you know, senior VPs and EVPs and things that we had in a bigger firm. And we said, look, let's have a principle based company. You deal directly with us. We work with our uh, general managers and we kind of customize everything. You know, we have empty canvas. So we still operate a few brands uh, with a lot of the soft brands we played with as well and we're involved with, but we really like the resort space and we like to really develop. So we're free. Right. Coral well, Tree is owned by a company, a family office out of LA called Low. What a great time to sell your company last December. Congratulations on, on all of that. So, so tell yeah, me. You know, uh, sometimes what do they say in the game of poker? You know, it's I'd rather be lucky than good. Yeah. So, Tom, I'm going to drop, drop some names on you. Charlie yeah. Peck, uh, Jim Miller, Mickey Miller, uh, um, uh, Mark Hickey. Um, any of those names uh, sound familiar? Yeah, those are all you know, colleagues. You know, so Charlie and I, uh, actually, uh, Charlie and I, uh, that's how I joined the company. I'm a part owner of a, a beautiful resort up in Sun, in, um, in Oregon called Sun River. Uh, Charlie Peck was first managing director before he became president. So Charlie and I remain great friends. We also have a vacation home next door to each other. Uh, and then Mark Hickey, um, I've known Mark Hickey for 30 years. It goes back to his Aircoa days. And Mark worked with me. He ended up... Uh, running our rental management company, uh, DRM, we called it, uh, basically a vacation rental business. So Mark's great guys. We have great people over the years. Yeah, Mark, Mark, is, Mark is one of my favorite people in this industry. And Charlie Peck is a legend. And I don't know if he really likes me that much, but um, I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, we is, 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 Charlie, is Charlie one of those people that didn't hire you? Anthony, well, there's a whole lot of them out there. No, he hired me, but I don't think he, I think he regretted it after he hired right. me. And um, <laughs> uh, I will just tell you, we had one meeting at the Algonquin Hotel and then uh, our last meeting together. And every time I see him in an event, it's more like, you know, like on, on, uh, on friend, not friends, but um, Seinfeld, hello, Newman. It's like, hello, Newman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew our cross over, you know, overlapped at Algonquin. So, you know, we were part of that. It was, that was some time ago, man. Yeah. That, well, yeah it was probably like 15 years ago. Do you know, yeah. do you know the Millers? Do you know Miller Global? Oh yeah, sure. Sure. Th those are literally right. my favorite people in the city. Uh, this is riveting content for the viewers, by the way. Well, you know what, <laughs> what it is, 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 Glenn, it shows you that I'm a player in this industry. And I, I know did. Everyone, and you that know you know, sit there and be quiet, okay? <laughs> All right. All right. I'll just I'm just going to say the <laughs> So, um, you know, Chris, I want to get you in on this conversation uh, as well. I don't know any of those guys. Uh, I know I a know. lot of people, but I don't know any of them. So let me start by asking Tom a question and then get you to uh, respond. Tom, what's the state of things um, right now? You're saying you're operating these smaller hotels. How do you see the state of business? Well, let's try to focus on some of the positive stuff that you're seeing out there right now as we try to find recovery. 
Yeah, no, look, I, th I think there's more silver lining than any of us are giving it credit. You know, we have large resorts. Uh, you know, we're in Charleston, we're in uh, Bend, Oregon. These are golf resorts, uh, four or five golf courses per, per location, spas. And what we have learned, we opened up some of those hotels and resorts uh, two weeks before Memorial Weekend. Traditionally, this is their peak season. Uh, they went from zero to 90% occupancy in five days. Going in, it's all because they're feeding out of the drive market. A uh, Bend, Oregon feeds out of uh, Portland, Oregon. Up in Washington State, we've got a large uh, 6,000 acre resort called Suncadia. It feeds out of Seattle, and they're on fire. Uh, they, you know, we had to bring back staff, um, t you know, two times more than what we thought to handle call volume. And then, of course, the un the opening of a lot of the amenities, the restaurants, uh, the, the pools now. Um, they're, they're just uh, overwhelmed with activity because I think people have all this pent up anger of sitting in their home, you know, talking to family and they just want the open spaces. So that's really positive. And the leisure demand, you know, the ultimate question is, is the leisure demand for the drive market, is it sustainable? Right now, it's replacing about 50% of the group business. I think in the end, that's not going to be as sustainable. I think we're going to see the leisure demand uh, temper off here. But, you know, the group business, uh, just in Charleston, we just had a 400-room group. What? Uh, a 400-room group booked for in the month, for the month, in June, that just came to us. And they're going to apply all the social distancing. Anthony, you're muted. Yeah. Was it a business or was it a family reunion? Was it government? What was it? It's, it's a business and it's an incentive, uh, an incentive for them. So they're actually added to it a business component where traditionally it would have been just, you know, kind of a, a reward and play. Uh, but they've added a business to it. We have to design our meeting spaces and the F&B experiences and the like to meet those objectives. They're doing things outside. We created an outside meeting room environment, those types of things to give greater comfort. But I'm encouraged by that. So mm -hmm. just silver lining. And I will tell you the other thing is, uh, you know, our business is all about the touch, right? And so, you know, these employees of ours that have been at home, um, you know, dealing with kids that are e-learning that were typically gone at school, uh, maybe families that had double incomes, both going to work, they get back to work and they're in the best mood they've ever been. They're anxious to see their friends. They want to serve the guests. They're willing to get back and earn some money. So, you know, there's a kind of spirit that uh, also is out there. And I think it's really good for our industry. Yeah, it's the first time I've heard that I think, uh, in the month for the month 400 room group. That's, and that's, that's really refreshing. And we have seen the um, the basic booking window go from what, you know, seven to 14 days down to like 12 hours. Yeah, uh, so crazy. It's good to see that the business, the business booking window and we haven't really talked about that. We haven't really looked at that because we know that those 400 room groups usually take months or even a year to kind of uh, to, 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 to schedule. So to be able to to look at a 400 room group that booked in the month for the month is very unique and, and maybe a trend. Chris, what do you think? No, yes. I mean, no, I, no I, I mean, it's fine. I, I agree with what Tom's saying. They've got a great company over at Coral Tree. They got great assets and they have a lot of drive to assets with resorts, like he was saying, we're seeing the same thing in some of our drive to markets. And honestly, I'm just off a big webinar with one of the data data producers and things are better even than we think right now. Demand is spiking a little bit higher up almost 10 points heading into the back half of June. So, you know, and we're already over 40% as a, as a nation. So that's past where China was at this time. I feel like when we add together the drive markets and the leisure demand of people being cooped up, that we could see a better summer than we're even imagining right now. Yeah, we, so we said good. a couple of weeks ago on this show, you heard it here first, folks. We said this may be the best summer we've had in a very, very long time. And that's shocking to hear. But people, when you put people down for three months and uh, they've been teaching their kids, they want to get out. <laughs> well, Anthony, here's the thing. The the you know, the, the business travelers gone in the summer anyways. Right. Right. And so now everybody's been planning a vacation on top of the business traveler. Everybody's like, I got to go somewhere. And I think we could see a huge surge and it is going to be, you do need to be ready because like Tom said, where we've opened back up, we've opened up much faster than we expected in places. Now that's fascinating. Tom, now you had said you expect business to uh, temper off, but what do you think about the whole notion of, Hey, I'm not going to get on the airplane this summer. So that business that you never would have had, 
maybe they'll get into a car and come and visit one of your properties. Is that something that might make it less of a drop off than perhaps you're considering? Or have you factored that in? Yeah, no question about it. I mean, I always, you know, I keep asking myself and, you know, the, the, the bottle of wine discussion with friends that says, you know, what are we going to learn from this three months? Like we learned in every other downturn. I always, I've got three kids that are uh, in the hospitality business and they think that TSA and our airports were have been there forever. Well, everybody forgets right. that <laughs> byproduct of 9-11. And so I, I think what we're going to learn here is that family vacations, the staycations that became so popular are really back in vogue. Uh, we're seeing that people, you know, we have a beautiful resort, Terranea Resort in uh, Southern California. You know, it's right now 40 minutes outside of um, uh, Los Angeles. Well, people are just to get out of the house. They're booking a bungalow and a casita just to make it their temporary office slash playground for a change of scenery. So I think we're going to see that when we're, of course, we're sending out digital images of, you know, the experiences, which is open spaces. So the difference in a resort is that you've got a golf course that's surrounded by trees and open air. You've got trails, you know, water parks and, you know, uh, rivers and streams. People feel comfortable there. So I think that's going to happen for sure. You know, I worry. I still worry about the, you know, we've got lots of urban hotels, uh, Chicago, San Francisco, et cetera. And, you know, that market's um, we're trying to be creative. We're also, uh, you know, I always say we're re-engineering our organization. You know, we got familiar with that term right sizing in the last downturn. And, you know, now we're, I don't like the term right sizing, but I like to say we're reimagining the experience because uh, urban hotels, we have to run a little different, yet still give the experience. Another question that keeps coming up is, you know, all the prognosticators said, uh, hey, the, you know, rates are going to really drop. Uh, we took a different tact. That is just, you know, not happening. My view is that rates are going up um, and that's because demand is. Now when demand softens, right now there's some pent up demand and I do think it'll temper off a little bit and we'll all adjust and become more agile. But that's a good thing too. But what's interesting with the rate then is the guest, irrespectively, still wants to have a great experience. Yes, he wants to be safe or she, but they also want to be pampered. So, you know, we kind of went into this thinking we're not going to do daily maid service. Right. We're going to adjust our resort fees. And in the end, we've adjusted again and saying, no, we're, we're back to offering a, a turn down product. We're doing it different. You know, it's more than just a to go food order. It's really, you know, fun dining in unique places. So I don't know. I'm, I'm having fun with it now. You know, I, I stressed out uh, the first. Of you know, course. You know, but uh, I'm done stressing. And now it's how, how do you, you know, create something special? And I think it'll stay oh, with us for a while. I think creative people, this is a really good playing field for creative people. And, you know, I want to go back to what you said a little bit about revenue management. In 2008, uh, when we had the downturn and even after 9-11, we didn't really put a lot of stock into revenue management. We kind of played around with revenue manager, and yes, we have to we have to now hire a revenue manager, and we have to pay them X amount of dollars. And okay, but now we are literally focused on our revenue management more than we are even on our general managers. So our revenue managers, and I think because they are a real profession with real experts out there, they prevented people that wanted to drop rates. Whereas in 2008, we followed everybody with a race to the bottom. So I want to give credit to those revenue managers who are watching those numbers, and and again looking for those trends where we go from 12 days you know, out a reservation to 12 hours out. And, and they're noticing that, and then they're immediately uh, changing rates based on that. So you know, it's a, it's a big, um, not only to ownership um, complement, but also to those revenue managers who are really uh, keeping us abreast of what's happening second to second. People say in New York City, you know, how often did we change the rates? Well, um, probably every second. I mean, we were looking at rates, literally, if, if my revenue manager went on vacation, um, they were looking at the rates constantly, even on vacation, or their assistant was. So um, I think it's just the maturity, and that's why you don't see a race to the bottom. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm with you on that. The only thing I'd add to that, Anthony, is that you know I think sometimes we think of revenue management, and we immediately go into that you know um, calculation of occupancy and rate. In my mind, today, right now, it's more about total revenue, right? So you know, now the the new acronym is you know a uh, uh, T. -T total revenue. And to me, because of F&B and because of the experience, I'll give $5 of rate to get another $100 of other spend. And these, awesome. re right. these revenue analysts, they're unbelievable. And they're so important. 
and it's dynamic. It changes Monday five times a day, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, I mean, what, what, Tom, no, what Tom's talking about is something that we've been focused on for a long time, and it's huge value is, is making sure that you don't get so focused in on the, the net ADR that you lose sight of parking and resorts and food and beverage and um, bar revenues. I mean, you got to have guests in your building to spend money. So when you're looking at total guest value or total rev bar, those are the factors that make a difference. And then to Anthony's point, this is really our third cycle where technology has started to take shape and shown the way we, we now we look at rates and bookings by segment by channel by day by minute and we didn't have that technology in 2009 it was just being advanced at those times so now you know what we saw this big rate drop was all because we stripped out bar and we stripped out our business travel ibt stuff and we stripped up national corporate and, G, and um, the gds bookings and went to just contract crew around the country and limited service focus service hotels now when those channels come back as long as we haven't done anything the rates are going to come back. We're going to just going to stretch the rate upwards. You know, Chris, to Tom's point. Tom's all that, point. All that micro, all that focus you just said, and all those you know acronyms, you just confused Glenn. So let's give him a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I mean, to me, it's fascinating. You know, I, it, it's fascinating, and this is the way the business is built today. And I'm interested to hear Tom's. I've asked a couple of other people on the show. You know, Tom, what is your thought about sales and marketing going forward? Is, do you see more of a commercial effort? where you know, we've got a longer range now for group bookings probably. And do you see combining revenue and sales in a fashion now that we're reimagining what hotels look like? Do you see that changing at all? And, and Tom, I'd also love for you to add in your, your comments um, a little bit more specific about how you're doing the marketing. You had mentioned the, the opening the wider spaces and stuff like that. Is it a subtle hit? Are you hitting people over the head? And how does it differ in urban environments? Yeah, no, uh, all good questions. Um, you know, I, I don't think, Chris, to your question, I don't, I don't think you're going to separate sales, marketing, and revenue. I, I'm not a believer in that. I think they were all integrated. You know, when they're not integrated, they they, they operate in silos, and silos mm -hmm. are ineffective in, in patients, in my view. You know, so, you know, one relates to the other. Um, I do think things are changing. You know, our office dynamics, right? We all have national sales offices. I've got global sales in three different uh, markets around the country. Um you know, they're building relationships right now. You know, I, I call them customer care calls. You know, I want to call in and I don't want, I don't ask for your business. Yep. I want to ask how you're doing. What can I do to help you? What are you doing with your team members? Could I help them? Can I provide something for your, you know, uh, first responders? But those relationships aren't forgotten. Um, you know, I've written more handwritten to friends, colleagues, ownership groups in the last 90 days than I probably have in the last two years. And, it, you know, the notes I'm getting back are astonishing to me. It's like, wow, no one's done that. No one's just asked how I'm doing and I'd send them a book or I'd do that. So sales is about relationships right now. People want to be heard from. There's uncertainty. There's no reason to force it. You know, that person or that group that calls and asks for the business, uh, now is not the right time to do that, in my opinion. Let it incubate and know that it's going to come back. And when it comes back, they're going to call those that treated them the right way in the down market. You know, I think that's the biggest challenge in, in our industry right now is that not only, you know, it's it's teaching old dog new tricks, but it's it's the young people coming up uh, that came up on the technology and don't understand sending the book and, and writing that letter and not asking for the business and seeing how you're doing. That's sales, building relationships. You know, is that a challenge for your company and, and, and the people that you see to really get that? Like, you, It's in your core, it's who you are. And one of the reasons I, I mentioned Miller Global, it's who they are. I mean, I yeah, love man. working for them because they always made me feel good. When we had challenges, when I ran Nickelodeon for them and I ran the Algonquin, it was never about, hey, congratulations on this or, hey, you screwed up this. It was like, Anthony, are you okay? How's your family? Hey, we know you like Johnny Walker Blue, so, you know, you can put that on your expense account literally and, and i was like okay i'll do that and um and i did and then they questioned me about it but i was like no remember you said i could do it but it was those moments of them making me feel like a part of the family and after they sold one of their hotels they made me feel like part of the family so it, that, that, how do you translate that to the younger generation or just to anyone in your organization like do you, is that a challenge i don't find it to be a challenge to be candid i don't believe I, you know i'm a father of millennials per se and i i, I don't uh, buy into the kind of description that they get or the moniker they get. I agree hundred percent. I think it's in your core values. Look, I, in times like this, the greatest attribute of leadership is empathy. Um, right. You know, right. so people that 
you know, if we lays off thousands of people. Our industry has never seen what we've just gone through. So what are we doing about that? You know, our customers, you know, I just talked to, you know, one of our big clients, Price Waterhouse. Um, they just laid off a lot of people in their meeting planning office. Mm-hmm. You know, so we could be upset about that because we might see it as, you know, relationships going out the door. But I'm going to flip that and say, what can we do to enhance that? So I think you hire for values, you train for skill. Uh, I think we have it. Of course, there's always, you know, a way to get better. You don't take it for granted. You enhance it. You know, I just got off yesterday. We did a, a Zoom a call with all of our team members, and we're having a discussion about the social unrest in our country. You know, and it's not a preaching story. It's not a training. It's a discussion. And, you know, got notes afterwards that said this is so cool that we can see each other and we can just have an open discussion. And I think things like that help to enhance people to feel strong, to have their own values. And that's how they'll take care of their customer. Yeah, I mean, times like this are going to show what your what your core values are. I mean, if your core values are exposed as a leader and as a company in crisis times, right? There's no way to hide from it. I think Tom was excellent at explaining it. Yeah, and I, and, and I, love, I love what you said, Tom. And, and I think this is allowing us to slow down. You know, I think like, like, I want to take a moment here to talk about this. We were going so fast and things were so good. And everybody thought about the new car and the new hotel and, and the new position and what company. And I can choose any company I want. This is the package I want. And this is what I want for vacation. And we were basically, if you have a pulse and you can speak, uh, you're hired. Now it's like, slow down. Let's all listen to each other. And let's get back to basics of what the hospitality industry is. And Tom, I'll be honest with you. I haven't heard outside of Jerry and Dorello or or Horsey in the last you know three months anyone speak in those terms and that's how you build a business that's why you've been successful but we've got to really again it comes down to your core values it comes down to your mission statement i've never built a, i've never built a hotel or uh, ran or developed a hotel without building my mission statement and making sure everybody understands that and unfortunately um people were going too fast and now we were ch- we had to slow down and hopefully we build those building blocks back up where it's building relationships don't call me and sell me something i'm so glad you said that because i don't buy a damn thing i buy a person i buy a relationship i don't buy what you're selling me well the truth is we've been saying just that messaging for the last couple of months here too right it comes down to trust yeah well i think the other thing that's so cool about our industry and this is you know glenn your question is how are you marketing it yeah Remember, we're supposed to be storytellers. Right. Our industry was started as this little thing called an innkeeper. Um, and, you know, in an odd way, the more things really become so different, the more they stay the same. It comes down to the basics, right? So our storytelling and marketing isn't about a call to action. It's about seeing something that, you know, if you ever bought a second home, you know, the real estate seller will tell you, don't show them the brick and mortar. Show them what the lifestyle looks like if they had a second home in a, in a vacation spot of interest to them. Show them what this river stream looks like. Show them what it's like playing chess with your grandson. Uh, and that's what sells. It's the sizzle. So we're trying to tell our story, storytelling through imagery that shows people what we think they want to see that we have uniquely at our properties. And I think that's more important right now uh, than it is you know, leading with a rate or leading with a call to action with uh, pick up your third night free if you call by Tuesday at five. Uh, people want the story. They want to see it to believe it. Uh, or, and then they want to experience it. Or pick, they don't want to see a picture of bed anymore. They want to see a picture. They want, yeah. to, see, they want to see the experience a, a, around them. And again, you, you want to tell a story. You know, people are confused. It's like, well, how can everybody say that everybody has an attention span of three seconds because no one's paying attention anymore and, you know, everybody's texting, but people listen to podcasts for three hours because there's a story. There's a real heart. Why is this show successful? This show's successful because we don't prepare. We just get on and we talk. And people yeah. want to hear and have authentic uh, stories, uh, authentic conversations. And so what I try to do every day in my consulting business is I try to teach people. It's like, tell your story. Don't show me the damn bed. And it, yeah. uh, I'm so glad you said that. Absolutely. Well, where's everybody at right now, right? They're like me in my office here. I've got at least one, maybe two, maybe three screens at my desk. And if I have a few extra minutes and I'm daydreaming about a vacation, I was actually looking at one, by the way, getting ready to take my family somewhere in July. Awesome. I'm looking out in uh, one of the national parks and it's just big wide spaces, right? It's the dream phase. And what Tom's talking about is where we need to be investing our dollars, right? I, I think the days of the bed picture and the three for ones are gonna go by the wayside. People want 
time is too precious now, Anthony, to what you said. We've realized to slow down and time with our families, time with our friends. It's too precious to worry about whether it's $9 less or $8 less or I can get a third night free. It's really about saving and investing in time with our family. And then as us as hospitaliers, delivering them that dream, right? Hospitaliers, that's a good word. Hoteliers. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, we got a great question here for uh, for 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 the panel. Um, what are your thoughts about the direction about the most recent statistics about increase in COVID cases? Uh, make sure this positive trend does not go backwards. I would add, there's probably an element of more testing available, so there's more cases. But there's also the reality as people are getting back to life and interacting, the cases are also going up. Um, Tom, how do you how do you consider this issue going forward? Yeah, I hate to say it, but I think it was predictable, right? Right. Uh, you know, so first of all, you know, what we pray for at night, we pray for vaccines and we pay, you know, uh, pray for long term um, solutions to this. So uh, we're going to see resurgence, uh, in my opinion. You know, what you're seeing is uh, keep in mind the markets that are increasing are not the major markets. You're not seeing um, a New York or an Atlanta or Miami or Chicago or LA. You're seeing some of the secondary tertiary markets that are seeing increases. Um, you know, so I think we're going to see some ups and downs. I got a feeling that uh, you know some of this pent up anxiety that people had to get out. I think we're going to temper it back. We're going to see that there is you know something with social distancing, and when you start to get comfortable, you start to get relaxed, and you forget some of those protocols. You know, we opened up one of our you know. You know, great bars, rooftop bar, and you know we had it all spaced out appropriately. And within two hours, you know, you turn around and the tables are pushed together, and someone's on their second cocktail, and they're having a great time like they always did. And that's that's going to create problems. So you know, I think we've got to be aware of it. I worry about it for our you know the unemployment component. We brought people back. You know, there's concern that this W per se, we might have to go back that, and you know, our employees can only handle so much. You know, so. I think it's why it's incumbent upon us to figure out a way to really set the example in our hotels and resorts by right. managing and leading our teams the right way and making sure that you're okay saying to a guest, it's not about you. I'm not trying to save you if you choose to wear not wear a mask. I'm trying to save the people around you and please tolerate that with us. And we got to be comfortable enough to say that without putting that pressure on them that makes them uncomfortable. You know, yeah. and, I, and I think what's happened is you know, um, in those secondary markets, it's, it was their problem. It was New York's problem. It was LA's problems. It was Chicago's problems. And they've been down for three months and look what's happening. You know, people are having mental health crises yeah. and, and business are going out of business. However, if you see what New York's done, and we have not only flattened the curve, but it's really gone down and we're seeing some really good numbers. And I think now that those secondary markets are experiencing themselves and they're right. seeing their grandparents sick or they're seeing their family sick, they're realizing really what I saw in New York. And I mean, we were literally in Glenn, Glenn's here with me. You know, we're petrified. We were absolutely petrified. Now that our family's starting to move a little bit, it's uh, actually just as scary as it was three weeks ago for us. Because right. Now, I, how long can I keep 20 year old uh, kids in the house? All right. Now, I just want to I just want to remind everybody that the whole notion of flatten the curve was not to stop this from happening. It was to make sure that hospitals weren't overrun. Absolutely. We had the right yeah. equipment. So nowhere did it say that suddenly this was going to magically disappear. I mean, maybe some people were saying that, but that's not the reality. Yeah, in some markets now you're right? seeing the second. Right. You are you're seeing that. 90 percent capacity in hospitals. But, right. And, but I mean, people are now second. If I can just say this, uh, Glenn, people were second. No, no, guessing. All right, I feel free to interrupt me. It's okay. People, people were second guessing um, the governor on the boat that came in, and and and, and the Jacob Javits center being turned in. But think about when he made that decision. He made that decision when the hospitals were at full capacity or ninety eight percent capacity, and they were putting people in the parking lot. So, and now people say, "Oh, he overreacted." Well, he overreacted because he, at the same time he was reacting, he, we were shutting everything down. So I just hope that other secondary markets do not make the same mistake. Right. And I do not see, I still don't think anyone's going to close down, Chris. Yeah, no, I, I think, like I said, I was just on a long data session before we got on here and, and their, their assertion is that we're not going back and we're not going back to shutdown. We may have rolling shutdowns in some markets or some more increased restrictions, but the, the economy is going to require us to push forward. Unemployment, like Tom said, is going to require us to get back to some sense of normality while people behave. And Anthony has said this a million times, it's on us. I've been out of my house a lot now, but I've also been able to social distance. I've taken care of myself and my family. I don't get in other people's spaces. We have to behave appropriately until such time 
as we get herd, you know, herd immunity and, and we can get back to normal, which is what we all want really badly. But I do think we're going to move forward. I think that I don't think this is going to slow us down. Um, it may in certain markets, but not not across the nation. I think we're going to get back to I'm business. Just, I'm just concerned because what I'm seeing now is like you wear a mask and people make fun of you. Like, oh, you're wearing a mask. I'm not wearing a mask. The, the hotel I just stayed at wanted me to wear a mask. No way. I'm not wearing a mask. Okay, that's fine. That's to you. But to your point, Tom, like we're not really like, listen, I don't care about you if you don't care about yourself. But that's okay. You know, we're this is an American. You're allowed to make those decisions. We're not right. we're not in China where you have to do it or you're gonna you know you're gonna get in trouble. Right. It's, but but like let's again we're we're one people. Let's take care of each other. Right. Well, yeah. good good luck with uh good luck with that. Daniel says uh, it's unstoppable at this point. After being in Vegas last week, that's what I saw. Tom, it's exactly the the problem that we're facing out there right now. Uh, is the people feeling a, a false sense of security, being too comfort, throw too comfortable, throwing a drink, throwing two drinks, then all of a sudden all of the that precaution seemed to just melt away. I have to keep catching myself. Thank goodness I was with producer Jeff. We had to keep reminding each other. Well, he had to keep reminding me about everything. But the, the fact is, if you're not diligent, if you're not focused on it, then it's so easy to slip up and just pretend like it's last February again. Yeah. We're seeing it everywhere. I, you know, the lobbies, right? Uh, it's interesting. Somebody made a comment about uh, when you asked the question about the drive market and, and the airplanes. I have flown twice. Um, the one was, uh, unfortunately, to attend a funeral. Another one was for business. And in both instances, I thought the airports did an awesome job. Terrific uh, job. Didn't allow the in, anyone on the plane without a mask. Um, everybody, literally everybody in the airport was wearing the mask. I went two weeks later for the second flight, and you started to see the, rela the relaxing. It, it, and then it was 75, making up a number. 75% of the people in the airport were and you know, I ended up having a, a great conversation with the captain of a uh, United Airlines flight, and we're talking about it. And you know, his his point of view was, look, um, our airplanes are probably the cleanest they've ever been, and we've got crews that are double cleaning them. They're preserving seats. Uh, we've we've got most uh, guests that are on a plane are very very conscious about it because they you know uh, you know had real concerns and hesitation before they booked the flight. So I do believe that travel is going to come back. I think it'll be a little different, and I hope that people are smart on planes. I, you know, ones that I worry about is when we hit into flu season later in the year, and you know you see the person on the plane with some sniffles or whatever. And that starts to move into, you know, the, the spreading of germs. And that's where I'm real afraid about the resurgence. But, you know, people have to exercise common sense and not give up so much. <laughs> you do realize it's America, right, Tom? Yeah, I get it. I get it, man. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, we lost Chris. I think Chris got concerned about, I'm going to mention poker again and how badly I beat him. So maybe <laughs> uh, 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 Chris uh, just okay. mentioned in the chat room that he had yeah. to drop out. Okay. All right. So, Let's have a one o'clock meeting. Yeah. So, uh, well, I, I, again, you know, I think those are great points. And to me, and again, Glenn's heard me say it to nauseam, leadership matters right now uh, more than any, ever. And people have said that many, many times, but it is true. And not that fake bravado. Not that, hey, team, we can do it. Huh? None of that. It's like, are you okay? And if you're not okay, that's okay. And let, we'll take care of you right now. And we're going we're gonna to take care of you and make sure you, you get what you need so the, the team will go on. And when you're ready, we'll, we'll come back and get you. And that, to me, is compassionate leadership. That, again, that's what I learned Miller Global. They were compassionate leaders. They were tough. You get in a board meeting with them, man. You know you, you're earning your money in that boardroom. But right. we, when, when we went to dinner and when we were hanging out and we were just talking, they are the nicest people I've ever met in this industry. Dave Johnstone, not so much. Just kidding, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you must know Dave Johnstone. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, for sure. No, that's that notion of empathy, right, Anthony, that you just spoke about leadership right now is empathy. And um, I also think you're trying to encourage innovations. You know, I, I don't like the term innovation because it's a little bit overplayed. So I like the notion of reimagining and reengineering. But, you know, how do you do things different? How do you empower people? You know, we're a smaller firm, so we, we don't come with SOPs. We come with, you know, an empty canvas that says, look, let's figure out what's best for the guest, what's best for the business. And do something special and uh, you know it takes a collaborative effort to do that and you've got to trust leadership you know you, if, you, if it's coming from on high you know down into the organization per se in my view 
that doesn't work right now. You, you really need to meet in the middle. You know, our team members, I've been asking them every time I, you know, we do our, our calls. Um, what, do, what did the guests say last night in the restaurant? Are, are they feeling comfortable? Do they have new ideas for us? And if so, put them together. Let's implement them. We've got to be good listeners here too. Right. I, I love that. All right. So before we wrap up today, uh, Tom, I don't know why Anthony's dropped in the back of the room. Oops. Sorry. Sorry, Jeff. Um, before, uh, sorry about that. I, I think I, I actually, actually you, Tom said sneeze and literally three seconds later I had a sneeze. So I took myself out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before, uh, but before we wrap up here, uh, Tom, one of the questions that we had in the audience is any new projects that you have currently in the, in the pipeline. I love some of your resorts. I've stayed at Terranea, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, what a, what a great property. Yeah, thanks for the uh, the opportunity. Yeah, we've got a lot going on. We got a great new hotel coming out of the ground in um, uh, outside of Orlando called the Wave Hotel. Uh, it's going to be one of the most uh, technical, advanced hotels you're going to ever experience. Being built by a company called Tavistock, uh, we've got a uh, wonderful resort in the southern tip of Mexico called Vivo, which is um, you know miles and miles of virgin beaches where you can, you know, I'm a runner, so you can go out in the morning, get a run, and frankly, just feel like it's you in the ocean and the sand. You know, so that project, we got a great little hotel being built, uh, an independent right here, uh, um, outside the gates of Golden, Colorado, which is famous for Coors uh, plant there, but a beautiful backdrop of the mountains. It's going to open here in January. Uh, so we're really active. We have seven new projects coming on. Wow. Uh, so we're, you know, the good news is silver lining uh, for those well-heeled companies that build relationships and can really deliver and have experience managing through downturns. We're getting opportunities, right? You know, so I'm excited about that. All right. So uh, accepting resumes. <laughs> <laughs> Send them on. Bring them on. <laughs> you know, that's a good question. I just had a class yesterday with uh, a hospitality school in Portugal, and I spoke to 57 students. First of all, I would tell you, that those students were very focused. There's no cell phones. I definitely knew I wasn't in America. It was um, at least virtually um, there. And they has amazing questions. And one of their questions was, um, should I look for another career field? And I think Tom, you'll probably back me up when I said, absolutely not. I said, the one thing that you will need is you will need. And, and actually J Dave Johnson actually is the first person to ever say this to me. When I took over Nickelodeon Resort, he goes, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. And that's that's the mental uh, state or the mindset that people have to have coming out of college. Just kick my door in and ask me for a job. Don't come in politely. Don't come in. Would you send me an email? Make me pay attention to you. Again, respectfully, but make me pay attention to you. And Dave Johnston literally taught me that. And I've said it a hundred times. I say a hundred times a week. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. And again, like I got three kids, 31, 29, 28, they're all in the hospitality business. And I t keep telling them that I think it's a unique time to really express yourself as a leader um, because, you know, it's really an entire environment. Um, I think it's different. I, have a, I love sports. So my metaphor to um, leadership right now is baseball or, you know, 50 years ago, a baseball pitcher who was on the mound uh, pitched eight innings, maybe didn't finish the last inning, but he didn't leave the field. He went to third base or center field. Babe Ruth. He was a utility player. You got it. Well, today in, in baseball, you know, you got a, an opener, a closer, a middle relief, a lefty, a righty, a curve, you know, whatever it may be, specialist. But right now in our industry, what you need to have is passion, passion to be utility um, driven, meaning I want a leader that can understand the guest experience, who can understand the dynamics and prepared to do a little bit of everything. They're much more valuable than in good times when you have enough wherewithal and you end up hiring all these specialists. And then, of course, when it's time to furlough, the specialists go away. So for the young team members coming out of colleges or out of restaurants and hotels that want a career, I think if they can see it that way, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the industries is theirs to have. You just got to be able to have that mindset. You know, I told them, I said, if you like people, this is an industry for you. You have to love making people happy. There's yeah. a difference liking people and loving making people happy and if you don't have the heart for this business this business will crush you most people well i'm 55 years old most people i know coming up in this industry have either been crushed or they excelled and being crushed means they've either left the business or they have excelled and i would say the majority of people i came up with in the industry are out of the industry because it's not about liking people and it, you know, business is business. So you got to be able to be a businessman or a businesswoman 
but you also just have to really want to make people happy. I don't like a lot of people, but I love making them happy. And and that's where, where people say, like well, the student just they say, where'd you get your energy? You must have seven cups of coffee a day. I don't drink coffee. Uh, I, like, well, I just love this. I just love this industry. Uh, so where's that part where you make people happy? I'm waiting for some happiness coming from you. Andrew. No, I'm sorry. I make people happy that I like. Oh, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> There's a qualifier. There's a qualifier. Yeah. All right, Tom, uh, any final parting words, sir? No, I would just say this, um, you know, our little motto at Coral Tree to kind of be the ribbon that brings us all together as we talk about travel and you'll see it on our website or anything that we do. We say travel is good for the soul. And I think right now it's just so true. You know, it, um, we all want to experience some things and, you know, we think about our childhoods and some of your best memories. It's when you went somewhere with your family or best friends or your girlfriend, whatever it was. Uh, so, you know, I, I do want the, the world to get back to feeling comfortable to travel. We'll get there. We're going to promise a great experience. And, um, you know, we're going to do it one day at a time. And we're going to try to be ahead of the curve and, you know, create some really unique and different experiences for both the guests and for the team members. So, you know, I think we're, our industry is uh, pretty resilient. We've made it through many, many cycles. We'll get through this one. We'll come out. We'll be a little bit different. We'll be better. Um, we'll be smarter. And, you know, we'll survive again. So, uh, bring it on. Send those resumes and come to our hotels. All right. I love it. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Tom. That was really awesome. I can't believe we haven't no really known each other before. This yeah. You are one cool dude. So thank no, you I don't know about any of that stuff. I'm just right back to, you know, Anthony's Johnny Walker. So I'm a little, um, I want to join him with that little poker game. Well, I just, I just sent you my cell number in the box. So send me yours and we'll stay in touch. That's a deal, guys. Right. Hey, thanks for having me today. Thank <laughs> you, Tom. We'll get you. We'll get, we're going to have to get you back again soon. All right. Anytime. Love all right. To. Awesome, thanks sir. Thank you so much. Wow. Another great show today. Although I got to tell you, the highlight of the show for me was seeing that trophy with Chris Green from last night's tournament. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was fun. It was for a good cause. And I'll tell you, I love, I love people like Tom. And I'll tell you something in the water in Colorado, because every management company, every person I've ever worked with or worked for in Colorado, I almost moved that. Well, I didn't almost move that. They flew me out there with my family. Right. My wife didn't want to move, move away from her family, but um, just, just great people. And just, uh, just, just great understanding of our business. Um, um, I don't know what's in the water in Colorado, but um, I, like I said, Miller Global was, I would say, really my best experience in this industry. Working for those owners, and again, not easy owners, um, but you know, and that's what I want to get to young people in this industry is being easy is not what you want. You want people that are going to make you grow. And they make me. They made me grow and they gave me a lot of leeway to become who I was. And most companies don't do that. Most people right. are in the box and they didn't put me in a box. And uh, I think it worked out for them and it worked out for me. So, Glenn, what's going on with this new thing you're doing, Glenn? Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, thanks for asking. Go to uh, hotelreboot.com. We're going to be doing four great educational sessions that give you real practical information that you can actually implement in your businesses in order to return to profitability. We talk all about the big themes on the show. We're going to be drilling down to the specifics that you need to do to find success. Check us out at hotelreboot.com. And, Anthony, you got big news, too, at 2 o'clock today, right? Well, first of all, I'm very impressed with you that you actually got the URL hotelreboot.com. I'm very, very impressed with my Thank guy. you. Um, I I'm glad you didn't tell me because I would have stolen it from you. <laughs> um, but but that, that is a great, I mean, five minutes after you bought it, you, it would have probably been a um, hundred grand. Yep. And so so uh, good job on that. Uh, so two o'clock, please go to hospitalitysuccess.com and sign up for our free webinar. Um, so if you're a hotel owner trying to reboot your business, um, please uh, come talk to us um, and we will answer all your questions. So uh, right. So, so I think that these two things really complement each other. You got to do the hotel cool. reboot sessions. You got to do those webinars. Those are the types of things that are going to really help your business. This show's great. We get a lot of great information, but I know your webinars and stuff like that are really highly focused on the individual needs of specific hoteliers. Right. And what's uh, interesting is that at the end of this conversation, I'm going to make a deal for you uh, yep. to buy reboot.com. I love it. All right. <laughs> right. Here it's $100,000. All right. All right, brother. Uh, All right. Man. Uh, all right. Thanks all for being well, here. Make sure you... that we taped yesterday. When are we showing that? Four o'clock today. All right. So we're going to be streaming at 4 p.m. today, a conversation that we had yesterday all about the truth about hospitality, hospitality diversity. So if you want some real talk, tune in at four o'clock. Uh, that is pre-recorded. So we won't be able to have uh, questions and comment, but it's really important session to be a part of. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, I loved the conversation and uh, it was very inspiring. And I and I and I made new friends and uh, I'm sorry, it was just a lot of fun. So thank you, my friend. So um, what? Thank the, you. All what, right, guys. What's your, what's your cheesy quote? 
<sighs> My cheesy quote is, text the word hotel to 6686 for more great content. Subscribe to our newsletter. But more importantly, you've got one life, so blaze on. And thanks for checking in. See you tomorrow.